Okay, so hi everyone once again. Welcome to our concluding session of the fourth day of the Blockchain Community Day conference. Today we are talking about blockchain technologies and our concluding session for today is uh, named Akinaki, uh, the B word that keeps you honest. Together with our friend uh, from Gash, uh, co-founder of Gash, Mitya Garashevsky. Nice to meet you, Alec. Sorry, it disappeared, and, I think. Sorry, I yeah, believe no, it's now okay. it's fine. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, thanks. So uh, it's not the first time that you are presenting uh, on uh, the stage of the blockchain community. And uh, I believe that we are will be having a good continuation, a good extension of the topic about the Akinaki since we had a webinar uh, conducted in March or February this year, I believe. Yeah, I think we can now see your presentation, and I wish, I wish you good good luck. The mic is yours. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Alec. So we we will talk about consensus protocols today, and uh, like particular consensus protocol, which we call the Akinaki. Um, yeah, I called it session because we believe Akinaki is a is a, is a girl actually, so uh, which keeps you honest, and that's the idea of any consensus protocols, of course. But in truth, like the, the paper that I'm going to talk to you today called, in reality, Akinaki Probabilistic Proof of Stake Consensus Protocol with fast finality and parallelization. Um, but, uh, you know, it was too boring. So the paper was presented on uh, Applied Cryptography uh, Network Security Conference to 2024 and will be published in Springer uh, Lecture on, on uh, Computer Science notes um, in July, I believe. So why did we do this? Well, we did we did do that because Gosh is like, as you some of you may know, is a Git on chain uh, protocol, and uh, we run on like one of the existing chain architectures, blockchain architectures, and very quickly we found that no existing um, blockchain architecture can actually sustain the load that we need. If you think just pushing one Linux repository with like fifty million objects on chain, well, good luck basically. So, um, and for that, like last four years, um, we were researching the new consensus protocol that might actually do this. So the motivation was like that we need to, uh, to create a, a vastly scalable protocol, but also with the reduced finality time. And uh, we thought in terms of parameters of the protocol, it should be less than one second, right? And Still, we, we had to, you know, retain all the security guarantees of the consensus protocol. And we will talk a little bit about today what are these actually. Oops, sorry. So the short description. Of, now, the protocol is, is um, extremely simple, actually. And it's a probabilistic protocol. Um, and this is a probabilistic protocol because in deterministic protocols, like PBFT, for example, um, there is a constraint on the message complexity, on the lower bound of message complexity that you cannot theoretically cross and that has been proven. So the only way to create a protocol that is kind of, uh, has a lower message complexity is to give up on determinism. But I would argue now that actually there is no real trade-off. Well, for once, even if you use like consensus protocol like PBFT, for example, you still use cryptography. And as we all know, cryptography is probabilistic, right? So here your determinism is just gone. So there are no, like there are deterministic algorithms, consensus algorithms, but there are no practical consensus algorithms which are deterministic because simply because you, okay, for once you use the, you use the uh, cryptography, right? So. So it's not real trade-off, it's just a question of how, what is the probability basically of attack? That's that's real question should be asked. There are no deterministic protocols in practice. So what's the probability? Okay, so let us discuss this. So the protocol works in this step. So you have a block producer, which is a guy who produces blocks. Produces blocks, sends it to the network. Like, then there are guys we call block keepers, which are just basically taking the blocks, and 
sending back an attestation that they received the block. The attestation is their signature and a uh, hash of a block. They don't check the block. They don't really like verify the block. Then some of them, uh, this block keeper, like all of the block keepers, will take the block and run some function, which will randomly select who are from them need to verify the block. And we call this verifiers Akinaki, in fact. So some of them will know just by running calculation locally, there is no nothing agreed except for the block that they got. There is nothing that they agreed upon. There is no random function, uh, like network random function. There is nothing that they know except for the block. They will take their own key, like the, their own private key, and they will just divide the key in the hash of a block. And if they and then on, on module zero, for example, and they will if they get the, the number, uh, like ending in zero, they know they need to verify. They will verify the block. And if the block is correct, they will send ACK, acknowledgement message to the to the network. And if it's not correct, they will send NAC. That's it. That's the whole protocol. Um, so we pre how we select the block producer. In fact, in this protocol, the block producer does not need, 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 does not need to be random. It doesn't actually matter. The block producer, we're not changing that uh, producer uh, unless like it is doing something wrong or does not produce blocks. In all other cases, from our perspective, it can be completely malicious. Right? It can, can be totally rigged. Um, so there is some function that, you know, just random sampling, which we just on based on the on the block that the first block, which is zero state, or the block that wants to split, like the, to have another block producer because it's a multi-sharded network, multi multi-threaded network protocol. But we're not talking about that today because that is already easy kind of implementation details. Let's talk about just the consensus algorithm itself. Right. So okay, so we take this the hash of this block and we just random seed and we just run a random sample function and and we know okay block producer say okay I'm a block producer for this block that's fine so I'll do I'll do the block that's all the randomness here again doesn't need to be really random from this security standpoint so this is the Akinaki so okay I'll receive the block as a block keeper I receive the block now I run this Akinaki selection uh, algorithm as I said so I take the total number of nodes yeah that they, then there is a like desired number of Akinaki per block, approximately again, it's, it's, a, it's a, like the average function. We will not know exactly how, how many Akinaki need to be or will be, right? But it doesn't matter actually. So I take the current block and I take my secret key. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So I have some secret key, like everyone has a secret key. I just, okay, I just divide two numbers and I, I, I know if I'm Akinaki or not. So this is like the algorithm of the random variable that denotes the number of block keepers. Like Al algorithm allow us to like in in independently determine Akinaki for each block. And it allows us to control that of the average number of this Akinaki in the network, right? So that kind of will determine how much, like what is the probability of that that we want to have. <laughs> And uh, we will see that we can actually change these numbers and, and tweak the parameters in the way we want, like in the way the, one, the network wants. So what are the safeties, like guarantees, and assumptions, I would say, first, maybe? Like in any consensus protocol, you have safety, a consistency assumption, and liveness. So the safety assumption says that no two honest block keepers accept different blocks of the same height. And no blocks with the incorrect transaction is going to be finalized. And so that's the safety and consistency. And in aliveness, if an honest block producer receives a transaction, it will eventually be included in every honest ledger. All right. So if, if the block, block producer will produce the block, it will be included. There are some specific attacks, specific safety attacks to this particular protocol. And that's already going a little bit of, to the details. Like, for example, the block producer may create too many blocks attack, and uh, this will create kind of a, a load, computing load on the network 
under which the the Akinaki will not be like will not have enough time to to send the the, the attestation to send the uh, the Akinaki to the network. For that, we include minimum timeout, so the blocks cannot be produced too quickly. So if, even if the block producer malicious will create blocks like every ten milliseconds. There is still the parameter on the network. The block keepers will simply not send the attestation back to the network um, if the minimum timeout is not passed. So that will kind of slow down the the, the acceptance of the blocks. Now, the, another one is the too complex execution. So the, the one block producer, again, malicious block producer, can create a block and include some kind of very, very long computation inside the transaction and send it out in a hope that Akinaki will just, you know, basically stall and will not send the NAG because there is just too complex execution and they need more time. So for that, there is a max verification time. So if the, if the Akinaki cannot verify the block in particular time, he'll just say too complex message, like NAG with too complex message to the network. And this block will be verified. And then if found that indeed it is too complex, the block producer will be slashed. And too soon finality attack. So like the blocks may be finalized too quickly. So there is no way for the Akinaki to be able to send the NAC message. And for that, we just have a parameter in the network with a minimum finality time, which is usually one second. Oh, you can of course take it the way you want. Um, but basically that's where the, like we need to put a threshold for the, because there are some because our message is delays in the network and we need to take into account the block. So the block time, let's say right now in Akinaki network, the block time is 300 milliseconds, 300, like 330 milliseconds. So the, like the minimum finalities is, is, so verification of the block is let's say the same 300 milliseconds. So that will give you like 300 milliseconds plus whatever the block travels to Akinaki and from Akinaki, there is an Akinak to the network, right? So that's that's about the like it should be okay, the threshold in terms of getting these messages. Right? Again, it doesn't need to be precise. Then we have this. Okay, so what happens if the block is, is kind of wrong? If we discover that it, it we have a NAC. So that is a separate procedure. Of course, that will yeah, kind of stop this network delays the produce production of the next block because the NAC has been received. Then we kind of create a committee and committee is a, is a normal BFT committee. Like you can have a, like two thirds of the network just verifying the block. And if two thirds of the network says the block is not okay, then block producer, which tried to produce this block will be slashed for a whole stake. And all the Akinaki, which did not kind of, which sent AK instead of NAC will also be slashed. Um, and then we have some some slashing conditions. So if block producer kind of produce two blocks of the same height, and if Akinaki is not performing, and we will talk how we know that it is not performing, right? Um, so non-performing Akinaki will some have some bleeding of the stake, and then uh, non-performing block keepers will bleed some stake. So if the block keeper set does not send attestation, then uh, like non-randomized block keeper keys will bleed stake. Um, non-sequential keys and so on and so forth to complex execution and so on. So there are some network conditions which are which are basically like we know deterministically after a certain time, sometimes or sometimes immediately. So if the network condition, like a session condition is, is um, like uh, catastrophic, like for example, the block is just incorrect or includes incorrect transaction, <clears throat> then it's an immediate slashing. If uh, and, and the network stops before it resolves, but if there is just non-performing something, less performing, which can happen non-maliciously, then you know it can it can wait. Okay, I don't want to go into this. is very actually simple. We have a okay, so it it is possible in the network the, the fork will present itself. Usually, it won't happen because it's not a fork because there is no it's only block producer produces the the uh, the block. There is no concurrent block production, right? Because of, it's not efficient to concurrently produce several blocks. So, um, so it, it's only one block. But sometimes it can happen that, for example, the internet stops in the block producer. Uh, the block producer doesn't know about that. Uh, he thinks that, or like she thinks that it produced the block. 
But so, but in this time, network callers recognize there are no blocks coming from this block producer and switch the block producer to the next one, which happens very, very quickly, actually. So in like within 300 milliseconds to like 600 milliseconds, the, the, the block producer will be changed in the network. So, and then suddenly the internet comes back, right? So it comes back and, uh, and the block producer didn't know anything, didn't receive the new blocks and send just, just same block. So we have like two blocks on the same height. There are, it's very rare, of course, because it need, the timings need to be really precise for that, but, but it may, may happen. So what happens? Well, if, they, if the block keepers receive the block from two block producers, then the simple rule of the, the fork choice rule of the larger stake behind the block will just, will just kick in. And so they will just choose one of the blocks because bo both of the blocks are fine. So let's talk about security of that. Again, it sounds like really, really simple. And I heard it a lot when people just, you know, it cannot be, <laughs> it just cannot be. <laughs> Actually, in fact, not only it can be, I think we can claim that this is the lowest bound uh, message complexity consensus algorithm that you can go. Like you cannot be more effective than that. We can we can actually I think well it, it's kind of intuitively it's easy to prove you will see why. So what we consider an attack? Well, we consider an attack when we have like forty nine percent, for example, malicious block malicious uh, malicious block keepers, like forty nine percent of the network. And then we also assume that the the arbitrary can also DDoS the network, whatever whatever they want. Like they can DDoS any number of nodes in the network. Okay, let's consider this scenario. That's like the nightmare. That's that's the most horrible thing that can happen, right? Well, because the, the nodes need to send attestation, block keepers need to send attestation. And there is a threshold number of these attestations that needed for the block to be finalized. It cannot DDoS more than this fresh threshold, right? Because simply the block will never be finalized because it needs attestations. Now, remember this node that sends attestations, they don't check the block. They just send the attestation that they received the block because we need the proof of broadcast of the block. This is, this is very important. And one of the contributions of this algorithm, actually, if you think about that, is that we separate the attestation of the block broadcast with the actual block validity attestation. And that is, I think, the kind of the brilliant idea here, if you think about that. All right. So what happens? So what happens is okay. So you did us, and like the the maximum possible nodes. So like you minimize the verifiers, the, the aki naki, to the part between to the distance between your malicious nodes, number of malicious nodes, and the, the DDoS nodes. And we run the calculations, and you can actually go and run it yourself. Akinaki dash plots at Goshasash. If you go to that website, there is actually the probability um, a formula there, uh, formulas, and and you can change parameters of the verifiers, the number of nodes, and you can run it yourself. So I'll I'll show you like so you can tweak the number of attestations and the number of Akinaki in the network desired number uh, and that station threshold to basically have any uh, security guarantee you want, anything you want. Like uh, we run here, like the comparison with the com like uh, outside out space object hitting the earth, the catastrophic, which after that, no consensus is necessary, right? So we, we know there is a scientific number actually behind this probability that someone is actually like, uh, you know, calculating the probability of this happening, like comet hitting the earth, that large, comment hitting there. And uh, we can tweak the algorithm to be that, the probability of that, right? Of course, we compare it with BBT and we compare it with Bitcoin. Well, in Bitcoin, there's no comparison. Like Bitcoin basically is 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 gone after 10% of nodes malicious. <laughs> so it's like minus. It's, it's, it's even not funny. Uh, I mean, the reason why Bitcoin has not been cracked has nothing to do with the uh, actual, like, uh, probability of an attack on a, on an Akamoto consensus protocol, and uh, we compare it with PBFT again. This attack when when you have more than two thirds of the now nodes uh, malicious, which is which will break uh, PBFT in a you know in, with a probability of one, and uh, you, we can tweak the protocol in the way that the probability after even after that the probability of an attack on 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 Akinaki will, will not be one. 
So it's actually not just theory. We have a we have a network running like that, and uh, we want to go mainnet uh, over the summer. You can see here it's it's a real screenshot. It's like yeah, we have like five hundred transactions in one block for one thread, which is one point five k per second in one thread. And of course, you can go like uh, I don't know two hundred, three hundred, five hundred threads uh, simultaneously. So what is the message complexity? Well, let's calculate. It's 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 if you think of that in terms of time, it's two. And that's I think why intuitively <laughs> in interactive consensus protocols, you like cannot go lower than that because of interactive. I would say you can argue that like ZKP maybe or some sort of ZKP, like a like previous uh, lecture that we we kind of um listen to um can have a non-interactive like can can replace some interaction right because i have a block i can i can kind of create a proof uh, right that that the block is correct and send it to you so i don't need to wait until you return me that but you will still have interactive properties that you need to have in the protocol for example the fork what if i created two blocks like this right okay so the blocks are correct what about two of them so you will still need some have an, to have some kind of interaction because you cannot prove of non-existence of something, right? So we'll still need some kind of protocol. So it's still the Akinaki protocol, even with the ZKP or, or let's say any kind of proof system based, non-interactive proof system based uh, block producer, you will still need, uh, the, still the Akinaki would be the, the, the most efficient protocol even for that kind of implementation. So again, I send the block, then the block keeper send attestation. And at the same time, simultaneously, the Akinaki, like Akinaki, Akinaki doesn't wait. The only time that it needs is, is at, uh, you know, verifying the block. It sends the block, um, it sends the Akinaki to the network. Now, the actually the block sends to all of the participants, so it's N, right? Attestation is only sent to block producer. It's not, it's not sent to all. So there is no quadratic message complexity here at all. Because the block keeper does not need to send that station to all the network. It can send it back to the block producer, even if the block producer is malicious. Right? Because the block producer will have to include the attestations in, in the next block. And that's how the block keepers get that they know that that attestation has been received. So, and then there is a verifier. So the verifier is subset um, of this, of the nodes. So that's it. That's the message complexity. So um, to the conclusion, okay, so the, the finality that we achieve is under one second because of the two-step communication process. Now, the Akinaki is, is kind of adaptable network because you can change any of the parameters. You can change the, the thresholds of the attestation. You can change the number of uh, average number of verifiers on the network. So you can kind of tweak, well, you can say, we even have the automatic function now that the network will just say what probability of NADAC it wants. And it, the, the protocol itself will adjust the parameters to be of the lower finality possible. So like it will try to make the less verifiers and slash, uh, slash uh, attestations possible. So again, uh, um, you, because, because the protocol is, is this kind of simple, in terms of the the message complexity, uh, you can you can actually run like any application like on a cloud. I mean, that's the idea basically. So the next step for us is uh, mainnet launch and uh, formal verification of of the protocol implementation itself um, that we want to undertake. And by the end of the year, I think we will be more or less finished. And I think I'm on time. Oh, one more thing, more one thing I wanted to add. So. Uh, we, we forgot. Um, so how do we prove that the Akinaki, like how do we prove uh, later on that that the Akinaki actually performs? Well, in it's it's like commit, it's like simple commit reveal. So in the beginning, the Akinaki uh, creates like many keys for many blocks forward, many key pairs, and it will commit public keys to the network. 
it, it's a little bit simplistic. It, it's actually more kind of uh, there is more optimizations there, but in general, that's that's it. So it commits the the public keys, and after that, if they want to receive the reward, they commit all the private keys, and so we can easily verify that they had to verify a particular block in the past. Right. So simple. And then if they didn't, we just slash them. But because no one know uh, who, when, and what blocks need to um, need to verify, um, that there is there is very the probability of that stays, like, and it's discrete. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mitya, for delivering uh, your presentation. Let me quickly check if we have questions in the chats. Just a second, please. I think there are no questions for now, but still, if there will be some, I will let you know after we publish this video as a recording. We will also link the uh, the previous uh, episodes with you in the description. And at this very moment, I'd like to say thank you to you for coming. And we are always happy to see you as a speaker uh, and as a friend and uh, as a partner. Uh, and I hope everyone enjoyed. Thank you so much for coming. That was our fourth day of the Blockchain Community Day conference. And tomorrow we will we'll be back uh, on, uh, at the same time uh, with Blockchain Community Questions. Thank you so much once again, Mitya. I hope thank you, yeah, everyone went, went well. Uh,